Hello, everybody. It's a particularly beautiful, snowy afternoon here in Oak Park. The sky is white, and my heart is very full because I get to speak on prayer with one of the really, truly greatest teachers I know, a great friend, a soul sister, someone whom I've loved for a long time and learned a great deal from, Diane Burke. It's impossible truly to describe Diane because you have to experience her, but amongst her many honors, worldly honors, is the fact that she was the co-founder of One Spirit Seminary, really one of the pioneering interfaith seminaries in the world, and a place that I've taught at often, and thank God with her. And when I began my Institute of Sacred Activism, Diane was a founding partner in all of that. And I always tease her by calling her the mother of sacred activism. So I'm daddy and she's mummy. What Diane has brought to my life is a profound wisdom, a wisdom born out of contemplation, a wisdom born out of very deep life experience, very full life experience, but even deeper immersion in the silence, in the profound depths of true spiritual practice. So Diane, I am so happy that you were willing to join me on this journey into prayer, these 40 days and 40 nights, a soul journey into prayer, which I'm hoping will prepare all of those who take our Easter retreat to be mm -hmm. open to the glory of what we'll be able to offer them because we've done it many times and each time it has been for us a revelation and I think for many of the people who were there. So thank you, Diane, and thank you for being with me. And yesterday when we were talking, you read me two beautiful poems over the phone and I thought it would be a wonderful place to start our exploration of prayer with those two poems. So, Thank you, Andrew. I, I would love to do that. And um, just before I do, I was thinking that part of the reason that we love teaching together on Easter is that we actually met on an Easter Sunday in New York City at a service that One Spirit hosted with our mutual friend, Marianne Williamson. I remember sitting in one of the first rows and turning around and seeing a face that looked familiar, but was someone I didn't know. And I remember saying, are you Andrew Harvey? And you said, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> and- I never just, forget that, that sermon she gave. Yeah. I mean, the angels must have been dancing with delight. It was absolutely, so extraordinary. Absolutely, but that was, that was where our that's true. Wonderful, wonderful, precious friendship began so that whenever we celebrate Easter, it always feels like a celebration of sacred friendship as well. And I'm excited for us to tell people about this coming Easter uh, a little bit later in our conversation. And I love the fact that you used the two words sacred friendship. Because in very many deep ways, that's what prayer is, isn't it? Very much. Is establishing a sacred friendship with the divine within and without. Turning up into this extraordinary, mysterious, direct relationship we are offered beyond all imagining with the divine. Yeah, I love, I love that imagery because for me, prayer is very... Uh, even, even in silence, prayer is very relational. And whether we experience the divine, I think we experience the divine in different uh, expressions at different times and in different needs in our life, whether it's as friend, whether it's as loving parent, whether it's uh, as creator of the entire cosmos, um, but it's always about being in relationship and allowing ourselves to enter into the fullness of experience of relationship. Um, 
as I was thinking about our conversation today, I, I actually thought of kind of a paraphrase of something that is attributed to one of your beloved sacred friends, Rumi, mm. who said something to the effect of what 40 days, I'm sorry, what 40 weeks in the womb does for the growing embryo, 40 days and nights in prayer, in spiritual practice, in early morning communion with the beloved will do for your growing awareness. So that's what- so beautiful, I'd never heard that. Oh, that is so, and this is the whole point of doing this journey at this terrible, tragic, dangerous, incredibly depressing, incredibly challenging time. That's why I was so passionate about getting it out to help people birth themselves into the glory of spring, the bursting out at Easter of new life on every level in every mm -hmm. realm. Wonderful, wonderful. So one of the passages, one of the poems that I shared with you yesterday, Andrew, that I just love is by an author named Joseph Grant in a book called Wandering and Welcome. And he says this about spiritual practice. True spiritual practice harbors this intention, the handover of self that places us on a collision course with grace. I love that. That <laughs> places us on a collision course with grace and draws us into a deepened state of readiness. And of course, the readiness that is asked of us in these amazingly challenging times is both an inner readiness in the sense of the deepest steady presence that we can possibly cultivate in ourselves that allows us to remain calm, that remind, uh, allows us to remain centered through whatever trials and whatever ups and downs life and the world throw at us. But of course, also the readiness to respond to what the world asks of us, to what the people around us ask of us, to what the divine asks of us in terms of being the voice and hands and arms and legs and feet of love on this earth. So that- and Those challenges and those demands are getting more and more intense day by day. Day by we day. see so many people suffering horribly, suffering from economic distress, suffering because they've been on the verge of ex eviction, suffering because they've lost people from COVID, suffering because they find the political atmosphere just devastatingly miserable, suffering because they're waking up to the agony that the whole world is going through, not just through COVID, but through all of the other exploding crises in our global dark night. Absolutely. I know that one of the things that has been so essential for me during these almost a year now since COVID hit the United States and, and since we many of us entered into lockdown um, has really been the sustenance that comes from immersing myself in inspiration and in beauty. I find it's like oxygen for me these days, whether it's music, whether it's beautiful visuals and art, whether it's dance, whether it's poetry. Um, it really has been what has sustained me and allowed me to, to continue on at times that it just feels like it makes, almost makes more sense to just pull the covers up and, uh, and go to bed. The other poem that I shared with you, which, which I just love is, is by someone who has become perhaps my favorite new poet this year, a lovely, lovely woman named 
Rosemary Watola Tromer, who is uh, who lives in Colorado. And this poem has been so inspiring to me recently. It's called Instructions for Perseverance, which I think is one of the things that is really being asked of us now. And one of the things that our spiritual practice can help us cultivate and develop. There is a, an epigraph to the poem, uh, and I love it because it comes from a horoscope uh, <laughs> in December uh, by Holiday Mathis. And the epigraph says, think less, trust your inner animal, which I know how much you appreciate. Absolutely. So again, the poem is called Instructions for Perseverance. It's the chickadee that saves me today. Though the world gets cold, the chickadee stays. Despite snow, despite frost, despite lack of sun, it doesn't leave this winter land. Oh, tough little bird who sticks around, who thrives in any weather, whose cheerful tune spirals like hope through the frigid folds of December, as if to say, let it come. I can sing through anything, <laughs> let it come. And it's that, such a wonderful image of prayer too, isn't it? Absolutely. That the chickadee is the prayer, the prayer within us, the one that in whatever circumstances we find ourselves, however dreadful, however painful our lives may be, nevertheless, we reestablish that joyful, hope-giving, hope-nourishing connection with the divine simply by turning up with faith in prayer. Yes. That's so and, astonishing. And, and wonderful celebration. Yes. Praise and celebration and remembering that the world is meant to be celebrated, as Terry Tempest Williams says. Not just celebrated, also to be, to be celebrated in intimacy as belonging to us. Yes, and we belonging to it. Right. And isn't that too what prayer is so wonderful at awakening us to, to the absolutely poignant and pointed intimacy that is ours to claim with the divine within and the divine without. All we need to do is to start talking inside our hearts to God, knowing that God is all around us, in us, and listening with supreme love and wow. supreme interest, curiosity mm. about the depths that we are exposing to God. One of the things that I love, Andrew, um, that comes from my Jewish roots is a Jewish spiritual practice that is really simply talking to God. And the practice, uh, if at all possible, is intended to be done outdoors and preferably when you are alone and uh, no one is, is nearby so that you can, you can speak out loud. And the, the practice really is simply just pouring out your heart as you would to the dearest, dearest, most trusted, most intimate, most loving and accepting friend you could possibly imagine. Just pouring out your heart and then saying, please help me, please help me. So wonderful you said that because when people come to me and say, I don't know how to pray, I don't know what prayer is, I always point them to that practice because it's such a marvelous beginning, middle and end for prayer. 
Start where you are. Talk to the great pregnant silence of the divine. Let it hear what's on your mind. Don't edit yourself. Don't use fancy words. You don't have to be very grammatical. You can even talk like Trump if you like. <laughs> no sentence structure. God doesn't mind. It's getting into that relationship that's everything because you feel if you really plunge into that practice and i've done it many times because one aspect of that practice is when you're really agonized when you're really broken down or when you're really angry with god the jewish sages say anger is a very precious form of communication don't waste it when you're angry at God, don't think you're going to piss off God. God is not going to be affected by your anger, but you will be so much richer inside, so much more at peace inside if you get your anger out. And when I was going through the whole mirror business, I would go out into the desert, which wasn't so far from my house, and really mm -hmm. howl with anger at the mother for what she was putting us through in this. And it was always amazingly healing. In fact, one time I was so angry with her, I was something terrible had happened. And I was walking down the street in Las Vegas where I was living with Eric at the time. And I stamped my feet and cried out, thank God there weren't anybody around. So they didn't. I said, you have got to stop this right now no more we've had enough it's we cannot go through any more of this we're going to die if we suffer more and i i promise you the next day the whole picture changed and what i understood in my heart when i meditated and what had happened is that she was able to activate immense grace because i had claimed the intimacy of a child with his mother I had claimed that intimacy. I'd been absolutely naked and raw from the depths of my suffering. And she must have smiled at that moment and just said, ah, right now I can set the grace in motion because now he's really sincere. He really is asking me and trusting me with his whole life. So there's a very deep meaning in this practice. Yes. and. and I love I love what you said about activating grace. Um, I've been thinking a lot about about grace in in these times and find myself coming back to one of Ramakrishna's teachings, where he says the winds of grace are always blowing. Our job, our responsibility is to set our sails. And so the way I would understand the experience you had is not so much that before you prayed, grace wasn't activated, right. but that you were somehow not aligned. The sails weren't in the right direction. The sails went weren't from... in the right direction. Right. And one of the reasons I think that's so important, I think something that sometimes gets in the way for people with with prayer as a practice is they don't know what they're praying to right and i think for many many people the the images of the divine that we grew up with the kind of old man in the sky with you know will stretch out his finger and touch the finger of adam i mean beautiful in some ways but for many people, that kind of personified deity, um, for many people, that's still very, very nourishing. But for many other people, that no longer is resonant to their experience. And as a result, people end up turning away from prayer as a practice. One of the things that I think is very helpful, that's been very helpful to me, is in that conversation, in that pouring out of your heart, a fine place to start, an absolutely acceptable place to start is, I don't know what you are. 
Absolutely. I don't know who you are. I don't even know if you are. But I do trust that there is something, something that is larger than this little separated skin encapsulated ego being that I believe that I am. And whatever that something is that is larger, perhaps there is a benevolence that I can open to. Perhaps there is something beyond what I can even imagine that can extend healing and inspiration and encouragement and help to me and begin there, begin in that state of absolute unknowing and not needing to know, but in a sense calling out to whatever force whatever presence of benevolence, whatever source of grace exists in the universe and just reach out. I so agree with you. And when people again come to me and say, I don't know how to pray, I also say to them what you've said, but I also say, have you ever just asked to be given the gift of prayer? Just ask whatever you might be beginning to begin to believe in to give you the gift of believing that you can speak with this kind of radical intimacy to God. Why would Jesus be lying to you? Why would Rumi be lying to you? Why would all the great masters and sages who have given us so much be lying to you? If they are so insistent about the beauty and encouragement and the inspiration that flow from prayer take them seriously and ask for the gift mm. the desert fathers talk a great deal about this in fact when you were trained to be a hermit the first training that you would have is a training in that first step of humility just that first step be humble before the testimony of the past from all of the religions that prayer is a magnificent way of connecting with the love and wisdom of the universe. Just that. And then if you don't feel that you can take the next step, ask for the courage to take that adventure. Yeah, that's beautiful. I love that. And I found with several of my pupils that once they've taken that in and asked, then quite suddenly something happens in their life or suddenly an inspiration of devotion bursts in their heart that they never felt before. And then they find themselves talking quite naturally and with great joy. And then the wind, the sails are adjusted and the wind can start activating its amazing miracles in their lives. I think the other danger that so many people face is that they pray for something. Mm. It's not wrong to pray for something. We all need so much. We need our daily bread. Jesus gave us that prayer. But tr the true depth of prayer is only found when you really are wanting to turn up in the presence of your greatest beloved, your greatest friend. That's when prayer becomes something that no one has ever really been able to express because it is so beautiful mm -hmm. because it's an invitation of that presence to reveal its subtle face to you and in you mm -hmm. so prek becomes the gateway to a very ordinary but very extraordinary sober mystical experience mm -hmm. which the more you know is possible the more addicted you become until you take what St. Paul says, seriously, pray ceaselessly, because you become so hungry for that security, that placeless, placeless security, that signless security. And you realize, yes, 
This is one of the many blessings we've been given as original blessing. This way yes. of connection. Yeah, you know what what's coming to mind as I'm listening to you, Andrew, is the experience when I was in my 20s, I was a ballroom Latin dancer. And I've seen the photograph. You should see these <laughs> photographs. Elizabeth Taylor, eat your heart out. You are so beautiful. Thank you. Yes. And part of what I loved about the experience of ballroom dancing was the, the experience of moving in partnership. And even though we tend to think of, you know, of that kind of dance as the man leads and the woman follows, that it's actually as you get to more advanced expressions of that dance, it's not like that. It's, it's actually moving as a single unit that is in continuous communication. And one teacher of mine described it as maintaining relationship through space. Mm. And I've been thinking a lot lately about um, the idea of living a surrendered life. And that image uh, for me very much evokes that quality of, of the dance, that there is such a synchronization with the divine, however we understand that, that it isn't even a matter of, um, of saying your will, not mine. It's a matter of experiencing your will is mine. That there is only one will that is the very um, source of, of life, that is the, the very thing that animates the whole of life. And that what we seek is, is, again, to come more and more and more into relationship and alignment with that, so that moving through our lives and having a sense of what to do next, having a sense of where to move next, having a sense of how to respond in any given moment is like the experience of ballroom dance where you're not shoved or pushed. <laughs> yes, yes. That there's, there's just the slightest kind of inclination and tilting that, that you automatically go this way. And so for me, more and more, prayer has become verbal prayer, spoken prayer, has become kind of a portal into just being in that divine presence so that that alignment, that attunement begins to be more and more and more natural, less and less something that needs to be thought about or figured out, or, or even asked for. I really love what you're saying because that's the deep reason why I wrote Like the Flame and collected together all the greatest short prayers I knew and I'd been gathering them for 30 years because in my own practice, I found that short prayers allow you that portal most quickly because you don't get absorbed in the gorgeous language you get drawn in by the beautiful language and then the depth of the meaning and when your mind and heart make love to those depths then this door opens into the presence and the presence is there and there are no more words yes. <clears throat> Yes. And that's when the beloved is there and you savor the beloved's presence and that presence soaks you and 
dissolves your resistance so that you can experience oneness. Julian Nor Norwich said that prayer is oneing with God. Hmm. And I love that. She coined the, the word, the verb. And there is no verb oneing, but it's in Revelations of Divine Love. Prayer is oneing with God, which is exactly what you're describing. Yes. And, um, and I think, you know, in very often in the depths of intimacy, we reach a point where words aren't needed, where simply being together, simply being in one another's presence is such, such a two-way sharing that kind of an image of, of looking at a magnificent sunset or you and I have been together in the presence of our beloved white lions. Yes. That simply experiencing that together and maybe every so often just saying, oh, how beautiful. Yes. How amazing. It almost is as if it's like you're going to visit a very great friend and you come in through the door and you begin with saying loving, lovely things to your friend. So the prayer is those beginning words. And then as the presence of friendship deepens, you can go into that silence of satisfied soul desire. It's wonderful. I remember when you're talking, I remember two things. First, rather frivolous one which is when we were in the back of the Jeep in Kruger and we had the most amazing day. We saw a leopard to begin with, and then we saw, which is very rare, and then we saw gazelles galore, and then we saw elephants, and then we saw lions. And I was pretending to you that I was manifesting all of these things out of my super consciousness, just to tease you. And you said, well, now I want a rhino. And I said, okay, I'm going to pray for the rhino. And I really actually did pray very deeply because I wanted you to be totally convinced of my um, omnipresent shamanic powers. And literally three minutes later, we were looking into the eyes silently of a rhino. Yes, yes, not 10 feet away. Not 10 feet away. And although I was playing, the fact I believe is that we were in a state of adoration of that immense outpouring of beauty that is Kruger. We were in a state of sober trance and gratitude. So when both of us sitting there really prayed to see a rhino, because we are both so drawn to rhinos, we were graced that chance. Yes, and, and I certainly have experienced that again and again and again in, in Africa, especially that, um, that's, that state of tremendous gratitude. You know, my experience there so often is that nature is just pouring herself out in blessing pouring herself out in blessing over and over and over again. And of course, the, the only possible response is, thank you, thank you, thank you, yes. thank you, thank you, thank you. And, and the more you thank, the more the, nature that's pours, right. the that's more right. open that's, you are, the more you can receive it. It's almost funny. Yes. At a, at a cosmic level. Yes. You and, realize and I, this is a participatory universe. Yes. At the deepest level, like quantum physics has revealed. And that is another deep meaning of prayer, isn't it? It's to turn up in the re relationship, yes, but also to tilt the field by the quality of your response to God, your response to what's happening, your response based on what you know you need to dance the best dance you can. I often find, and I know you must have found this very many times as a teacher, 
we live pretty exhausting lives and we are pouring each ourselves out all the time. And there have been times when I've arrived in deepest Idaho or in Wyoming after a night flight when I just can't imagine giving the sermon or giving the workshop that afternoon. And I, all I know now to do, which is all I need to do, is to just be silent for five minutes and say, please give me the words, give me the energy, give me the love, give me the patience, give me the passion. And I swear, it's miraculous. Just that turning up in one's exhaustion, begging to be filled, activates so much immediate grace. It's something I would love to give to everybody, which is why I'm doing this journey, is the sense that when you ask for what you need to do the dance with your ballroom partner, <laughs> the beloved, more exquisitely, more in service of others, you always get what you need. It's astonishing. Yes. And um, I had a, a very similar experience to what you just described. A number of years ago, I was between two back-to-back -back retreats that I was leading, and I was just exhausted. I had come into the first retreat already exhausted, and between the two, I had, I had like an overnight, and when I woke up the next morning, knowing I had to go into working with another group of about 70 people, I just felt like I cannot do this. I cannot do this. I don't know how I can possibly get through the next four days. And it was as if, you know, it wasn't like actually hearing a voice, but it was just this sense of hearing we've got your back. We've got your back. And this sense of just being able to rest, to rest back and, and know that I was being supported, feel that I was somehow energetically being supported. And and I remember at the time, I just burst into tears because it was such an experience of, again, of grace, but also that there is this enormous benevolence that is supporting us and holding us, particularly when we show up in the world to try to be of service, to try to be of help, to be a beneficent presence and force in life. It's as if the entire benevolence of life itself is, is there like, like a holding, a holding net of energy. And that somehow that simply our willingness to call out and the humility of saying, I can't do this alone, opens us, again, like setting the sails to experiencing what is already there, but that we haven't been able to allow ourselves to receive. Absolutely. I'm just, so many examples are coming into my mind, but what I was thinking when you were talking is that we are in a time of such suffering, but not just the suffering on a physical level, the suffering of half the country being enslaved by crazy, violent lies. And those of us who deeply and desperately want to be healing presences. I think all of us at times feel real despair. How am I going to approach these people who believe this madness and are prepared to lie and cheat and betray 
in the name of some strange, completely fabricated idea that is clearly half insane. And what I've discovered is what you said, is that I simply can't do it as Andrew Harvey. Mm -hmm. But I can do it if I relax completely and I ask for the beloved's compassion, infinite compassion and patience mm -hmm. to take over my heart and to release me from my need to persuade anybody to do anything. And when I do that through prayer, I find that I'm given opportunities sometimes to be able to say things kindly but firmly that can actually shift the situation a little. Mm. So I think why I'm inviting everybody on this prayer journey at this time is for two reasons. I believe that this Easter is going to be the most important Easter in all of our lives because by Easter, it will be very clear where the country is, and it could be in a very painful, dark, riven, even more divisive place, even more divisive than under Trump because of the pollution that these last four years has spread and because of the urgent catastrophes that need healing and need real response, but may not be getting it because of all the political madness that's happening. So. To me, prayer is one of the essential ways to not only to keep sane, but to keep on going. Yes. Keep going on, pouring yourself out with hope, with encouragement, with compassion, with steady respect for people of all kinds and of all possibilities. You won't be able to do it on... <clears throat> your own and even from a deep realization you won't be able to do it It'd have to come from the primordial depths of life itself and those are the depths you connect with when you pray with the kind of humility and need that you're suggesting we do please help me be kind please help me be wise please help me get those opportunities to speak words at this other person whom I love, but I feel is deeply damaged and deluded by what they're going through, can actually hear. I know screaming at them is not going to do any good. I know demonizing them is not going to do any good. I know judging is idiotic. Give me wisdom. Mm. And over time, trusting in the immense reservoir that is God, drawing from it through prayer, does give you amazingly what you need not only to keep going but to keep going on wisely mm -hmm. do you have that experience yes and and i find myself thinking as i'm listening to you about how many people right now in the united states and i'm sure in other places are struggling with the fact that the people that they feel so divided from, so estranged from. Yeah, are their closest friends and family. Are yes, are yes, friends and family. Yes, this is agony, and, yes. And how to, how to remain in relationship is just a huge, huge um, conundrum for so many people now. And um, I think we all, we all know so well that love, not, not in the sentimental or um, sugar-coated sense, but, but love in the sense of, of soul force that Dr. King understood and that Gandhi understood, that love is the only possible way through what we're facing now and yet in my experience very often if i'm really truthful with myself i don't have the slightest idea of what love means in a given situation you know we have a lot of ideas about what what it means to love and and many of them are real distortions 
you know, we think that love means letting people get away with anything. We think right. <clears throat> love means putting on a smile and pretending everything is fine. We think that love means making making nice and and smoothing over any kind of difference or disagreement. And so I think one of the most important prayers we can ask right now is teach me how to love. Show me what love, how love would express in this situation and not assume that we know. Yes, because love can have a very fierce side. Love can have divine ferocity and it can be unloving not to express that side. And yet we need to be able to express that side at exactly the right moment in the right timing. Otherwise it causes huge damage instead of healing. And this is one of the immense spiritual koans that all of the progressive side of things faces at this moment. How do we approach our brothers and sisters and family members and friends whom we adore, who have bought this hallucination, which is causing massive horror? How do we approach them with justice, with mercy, and with discernment? Because only divine gift of discernment, which is something I pray all the time. In fact, my prayer that I pray more than anything else, actually, is the prayer of the prophet, peace be upon him. Lord, show me things exactly as they are. Yeah. And I find that when I pray that prayer, I'm shown what the situation is, what the limitations of my own previous response to situations like these are, and what's appropriate in the situation, which can sometimes be extremely uncomfortable to my desire either to be loved or to be glittery or to be effective. Sometimes the, release, the response I least like is do nothing. Nothing. <laughs> you mean I've got to do nothing? And just watch this, yes, do nothing. And I find that when I get that extremely uncomfortable response, the situation shifts in strange, mysterious ways I couldn't have foreseen. Because if I had done anything, even from my most so-called illumined will, I would have mucked up what God was already doing in the situation. So really asking to be shown what is required and then asking for the courage or the insight or the brilliance or the passion or the energy or the ferocity to do what's required, that is a really important spiritual tool for people at any time, but especially at this time, don't you think? I, I do. And, and it also makes me think about the fact that when we pray and we receive guidance, when we receive an answer, it's for that moment. Right. It's not for that moment on into right. infinity. So we may argue, I can't do nothing because we're imagining that we will do nothing forever. Right. But we have to keep asking and keep asking and keep asking so that prayer is really a muscle that we develop and exercise just the same way we don't go to the gym once and expect to be in shape forever. In the same way, prayer is, it really is a practice day in, day out, many times a day. That's why the, the in Islam, there are prayers five times a day at set times. In Judaism, there's prayer three times a day. In Christianity, the, the hours set a rhythm of prayer in other traditions as well, so that we get into a habit of realizing, oh, I've, I've taken uh, the reins of, of discernment or the reins of uh, what I'm to do. I've taken them back from the divine into my own hands and 
help me remember to come back and ask again, ask again, ask again. In a sense, it's like um, tuning constantly your instrument to be able to respond to the playing the, of the silence. Yes. That you, through prayer, through constantly turning to prayer, to constantly opening yourself up to, you are then invited to be as supple and alert and ready and constantly able to shift as reality is itself. You're given by grace that suppleness of the dancer. Because in a great, a great ballroom dancing, I love ballroom dancing and ballet, but also I love ice skating dancing. I love, we've watched it together with tears streaming down our face because it's so beautiful. But the precision in ice skating has to be total because if you don't, split second time your movement you will end up getting your head bashed on the ice or at the side of the ring and i think we're going into times just as dangerous as that yeah when this kind of attunement through prayer through humility through gratitude through turning up asking to be shown what's appropriate and to be given through discernment the exact right mixture of justice and mercy and clarity and compassion that's not something that's just going to make our lives more beautiful it's actually going to make the difference between whether the human race has a chance to survive or not in a situation mm -hmm. as cataclysmic as the one that's brewing yes and that may be one of the important forces of this situation is that it's designed to drive us into prayer so that the intelligence that's actually allowing us to create this situation can reveal that there is a tremendous mercy in it because it'll make us so much humbler, more grateful, more able to use these amazing tools to truly put our deepest impulses of love and compassion into a real effective action. One thing I think that is really important to emphasize, Andrew, that you and I have been actually talking a lot about since January of last year, when you, when you last visited me in New York. Um, what we're talking about here is not the purview of a few sainted, enlightened oh God, no. beings. It's really the, the purview and the invitation and the task of all of us as true human beings, right. as true human beings that we have the capacity and the potential to be attuned and aligned as finely and as sensitively as you're describing, that that actually is part of our birthright and part of our nature. We don't have to be extraordinary in order to be able to live the way that these times are asking us, begging us to be able to live, but we do have to aspire to showing up in that depth of wisdom and compassion and peace and generosity of spirit and humility and joy that uh, that knows that the world is worth saving because of the joy that it constantly pours out and bestows on us. Um, and the beauty, and, as you said at the beginning, and the, the beauty. beauty. God is beauty, says the Quran, and loves the beautiful. Yes. And in a time like this, one of the greatest sources of beauty for me are actually the words in the prayers that I'm offering. Mm -hmm. I have chosen 
the prayers that are the most beautiful for me in the hope that they'll awaken that awe that only beauty can. Yes, and that is a marvelous place perhaps to draw this conversation to a close mm. because we, you and I could continue for hours, which we would both love, but Diane, I can't wait to celebrate this Easter with you. I can't wait because for me, this Easter is and must be a huge celebration of joy in defiance of a burning world. Mm -hmm. Because the greater the celebration, the more the stamina and the strength all of us ragged beings who celebrate will receive to continue the work of enduring with grace and building in our heart, minds, and in our relationships the future that is impossibly possible, that could yet be born, even in the middle of all of this madness. Yes. And I can't think of anything more wonderful for people to do than a prayer journey. Traditionally, it's Lent, but it's those 40 days before Easter that you deliberately and tenderly take a journey to work on everything in you that blocks the explosion of ecstatic yes that happens on Easter Sunday. Whether you're a Christian or not, you can think of it as the explosion of the secret spring that is always refreshing reality. So that's why this prayer journey has been constructed in the way that it is. And that's why it gives me such great joy that it will end in teaching our retreat together. Yes, yes. And, and of course, people... Um, that that culmination will be four days that we will offer through one spirit. It will be uh, a Thursday. It will trace the uh, the Easter journey itself. So a Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday morning into early afternoon, and and then of course Easter Sunday into early afternoon, and. Um, Andrew, may I may I share one more poem oh, with you that that cap for me captures all of this, in, including this culminating journey of the Easter story itself. Please and, don't feel you have to be a Christian to join this journey. Oh, not at because all. Because we've had people of all faiths. Because this is an archetypal journey from great grief and dismemberment and going into the cave into startling rebirth. This is a, a journey that goes as deep and as high as all open, wild, holy human journeys go. Absolutely. So this poem, and this may be a perfect way to com complete our conversation is again by the same poet I shared earlier, Rosemary Watola Tromer. This one is called More Love, More Love. And the epigraph is from Rita Mae Brown, Riding Shotgun. The epigraph says, sorrow is how we learn to love. If sorrow is how we learn to love, then let us learn. Already enough sorrow's been sown for whole continents to erupt into astonishing tenderness. Let us learn. Let compassion grow rampant like sunflowers along the highway. Let each act of kindness replant itself into acres and acres of widespread devotion. Let us choose love as if our lives depend on it. The sorrow is great. Let us learn to love greater. Riotous love, expansive love, Love so rooted, so common, we almost forget the world could look any other 
way. I love you. I love you. Thank you, darling. Thank you for a beautiful dance. Bless you. Bless you, Andrew. Thank you.